Welcome to the Leafy Podcast, helping real estate investors and entrepreneurs grow. Let's start the show. Everyone, welcome to Leafy Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. We love having you here. I am Tammy Geerling, the podcast manager. And joining us today, we've got Jennifer Glugorich and Brian Price. Both of them are CEOs of Leafy Legal Services. Thank you both for joining us today. And we do have a very special guest joining us as well today and uh, very excited, looking forward to this interview. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Jennifer and Brian to get us started. Yeah, we're so excited. So our next guest is a financial coach, a public speaker, an entrepreneur, and an author. She's helped people with $500 to over $800,000 in debt, including a client who had 86 credit cards, teaching them how to pay those cards out and pay them pay off their debt in record time. She's an avid real estate investor who enjoys buying, selling, and flipping. So of course, you know, we love our real estate investors. And she's bought <laughs> properties for as little as 10 bucks and turned that into thousands. Her number one Amazon bestseller is Money Matters. So I'm so excited to find out so much more. We're chomping at the bit. So everybody, please uh, let us welcome Karen Ford to the show. Hi, Karen. Hello. I'm so excited to be on here with you all. <laughs> We're excited too. So yeah. 86 credit cards, like oh. how do you even get that many? Well, that was a day of discovery for all of us, actually. <laughs> <laughs> for both husband and wife. I'll tell you what happened. I met with this couple and because they wanted to get some coaching from me and we sat down and I asked, a series of questions so I can see exactly where they are financially and where they want to be. And so we were going over their debts, et cetera. And I was writing down, making notes. And I said, okay, are, is that it? Is that all the credit cards? And I think at that time there were over 35 or 40. Mm -hmm. So dead silent when I asked that question. And then she said, well, I actually have some credit cards that he doesn't know about. So I said, okay. So I dropped those down and then he said, I have some credit cards that she doesn't know about. <laughs> oh, gosh, okay. okay. <laughs> it was all said and done. They had 86 credit cards between the two of them. And wow. every one of them had a balance. These wow. were not gosh. just credit cards stuffed in a drawer, not being used with an open account. No, they were open and they were active. And so I just said, okay, we have all cards on the table now. So we're not going to fight about this. And when you leave this room, you're not going to fight about it. Both of you were in the wrong. Obviously, you didn't communicate with each other. But from this day forward, we're going to do things differently. Yeah. Now what we need to focus on is how are we going to pay off these credit cards and how are we going to get you out of debt? So I was thinking it was going to be World War III between the two of them. And so I wanted to snuff that before they left the room. So... <laughs> Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, you think, well, so that brings me to my, uh, one of my first questions. What do you think the number one way is for your clients to control their money? Do you think it's just getting it all, like we said, their cards out on the table or, or how do you go about that? Well, all cards out on the table for sure. But I've coached people from the ages of 18 all the way up to, I think the older lady was 74, 75 years old. And the common theme amongst all those people was no one ever taught me how to budget. Mm -hmm. No one ever taught them how to budget. They have no clue. And I don't think that they teach that in schools today. So it's kind of up to us. It's up to the parents. But if the parents don't know how to budget, then they can't actually teach their children how to budget. So I would say the number one way for people to get out of debt is to learn how to budget. Mm. Yes. I, I would like cool. to say that I think that, that you're absolutely right, that we have a disconnect for school. I remember that I took yeah, sure. an applied math and it taught us everything from how to fill out an application you know, for a job to how to fill out like a car loan, something. And they taught us about these basic things. And right. there are, there's an entire generation that doesn't know how to do this. And then when you say, right. let's have a budget, I think that when they were told that growing up or how, whenever it came to be from work or whatever, it was done in how, what does that word? Not punitary way, you know, punitive way, almost like right. as a, a punishment. So right. when they hear that, let's get a budget it's like, oh, this is going to hurt. Right. Yeah. So how do you, how do you, um, how 
how do you handle that? Like getting over though, this is going to hurt or it's going to be embarrassing right. or I just don't want to do it. You know? Right. Well, I've had all of those and that's a great question. I always tell people, you know what? A budget is not a four letter word. First of all, it's six letters. <laughs> but a bad word. A budget is empowering because a budget is you telling your money what you want it to do instead of wondering where it went. And I find that if people ask themselves, you know what? I make all this money every month, but I don't know what happened to it. Or it's tax time. Let's say it's tax time and they get that W-2 and they see what their total income was for the year. And if the person asks themselves, I made all that money, what happened to it? Nine times out of 10 is because they're not budgeting. A budget is you telling your money what you want it to do instead of wondering where it went. And you're in, in the control. You, I mean, you're in the driver's seat when you budget. If you decide it's, a, and I think the word budget has a negative connotation at times. People mm -hmm. think, oh man, I got to eat bread and water or rice and beans, you know, or whatever. And they feel like you're, they're going to do without because they're on a budget, but that's not necessarily so. If you're the one creating the budget each and every month, if you want to go out to eat 10 times this month, go out to eat 10 times this month, but your budget's going to look a little bit different. Next month, you may decide you're not going to go out to eat at all. So you're in the driver's seat. If you want to spend $350 a month on your specialty coffee on your way to work, I actually had a gentleman I coached one time. He got a specialty coffee drive through on his way to work every day. And I said, okay, how many days a week do you work? And he said, five. I said, okay. And how much does that cost you each time you get that specialty coffee? And he told me, I said, you realize you're spending $350 a month on that coffee. His eyes got huge. He had no idea how much he was spending every month on coffee. So he decided, see, I, I'm the one who, it's kind of like a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I told you my history was a nurse and I used to help people get healthy physically and now I help people get healthy financially. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a person that goes to the doctor and maybe they're overweight and they don't know why they're overweight and they want to mm -hmm. lose weight. And the doctor checks their heart, checks their lungs, checks to see what are you eating every day, et cetera. Okay, maybe you need to lay off that ice cream you're eating every day or those potato chips you're eating every day. It seems like it should be an obvi obvious thing to them, but it takes somebody from the outside looking in to make that diagnosis and that decision. So that's what I do. I'm another pair of eyes that mm -hmm. looks at something and I'll pinpoint. So that's that was the case with this young man he didn't realize he was spending 350 dollars a month on coffee so he decided he would still get a specialty coffee but one day a week so oh. he was able to invest that other money he was able to invest or pay off debts with it so yeah because i think it's it's interesting because especially but you have to but also too you got to work with the person i would think on like what if that's the highlight of your day and they're like I don't have enough. That's the one thing I really love. Well, then you can say, okay, you can have a coffee a day. You're affording kind of of coffee a right. day now, but right. what isn't bringing you the same joy that that one coffee does? And That's then right. you can look at other things and go, okay, so keep the coffee. You know, it's not just, Hey, let's be miserable. You know, um, right. it's, you know, trying to, to right. not be miserable. <laughs> Right. Well, and I've had people say, well, I'm not willing to do that, to which I say, okay, you're not willing to do that. So if you're not willing to do that, obviously, I'm not going to make you do it. Let's look at what you are willing to do. What, you know, and we look at the fine line. We look at the monthly budget and see, is there something that maybe you can live without? Maybe you don't need to spend $300 a month on a gym membership that you go to once in a blue moon, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, you can make some necessary adjustments if you want to get out of debt badly enough, or if you want to build wealth badly enough, I would think that the person would want to make some adjustments to their life. It may not be the coffee. It may not be the highlight of their day that they would be willing to do without, but there's something in their budget they can probably adjust a little bit. Yeah. That's funny when you said get rid of the gym. I'm like, how get rid of the gym? <laughs> <laughs> so well, one, one thing I, I wanted to ask was, oh, go ahead, sure. um, was uh, 
Um, is there certain guidelines you have people go through and uh, other tools you have to maybe even track their budget? Is there certain things that you suggest that people start with at least get a hold on it and see where things really are going? Absolutely. I actually, I ask them, what are you comfortable with? Do you like an Excel spreadsheet? Do mm -hmm. you like using QuickBooks? Do you like pen and paper? The key is though, is you make that budget every single month before mm -hmm. that month begins. So okay. October 1st is gonna be in a couple of weeks. That October budget needs to be done before October 1st. Mm -hmm. That way it's a guideline what you're gonna follow that month. And then the second thing I tell them is, you know, you might spend a few minutes making this budget, just don't put it in a drawer and ignore it. Mm -hmm. I've had people do that. Well, I made the budget and I say, yeah, but you didn't follow it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I said, well, then you may yeah. as well not make the budget that because yeah. the whole point yeah. of creating the budget is so you have something to follow. Yeah. yeah. Does it take a certain amount of time for people to kind of get in used to it, like a few months before they really kind of really hone in on their budget? It takes about three months three to months, work out okay. all the kinks. There may oh, be times, okay. oh man, I forgot to put this in the budget. I forgot I need to put tires on the car or I need to buy a wedding gift for somebody and they forget. And I say, it's yeah. no problem. Just put it back in the budget. Yeah. Okay. I think that's great. And so this is what you talk about in your book, Money Matters, right? It's, yes. What is the whole title? It's Money Matters, Motivation, Methods, and Manners for Increase, right? That's right. Yes. And they can get it on Amazon. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll be putting that link here. Uh, other, so, okay, the see, at the bottom. I think that's really good because, <laughs> you know, if you, if you have to start out, like you said, small, put everything out on the table and then you can make little tweaks. And then before you know it, you have a little extra. And I love the, how you said, and then you can use that to invest. Some people, their investment will be in themselves. They're going to go on vacation. You know, we finally found that money to take that you know, to take the kids to Disney World or whatever it is, you know. Right. Um, but one thing I think is interesting is that you yourself are a real estate investor. So you did find the money yes. and you have that great story about the $10. So tell me, like, what got you into real estate investing and how were you able to, to do that through, you know, your budgeting and technique? Oh, absolutely. Well, I love real estate. We could talk hours on that. And I know we don't have that kind of time. So I'll, I'll make it quick. Well, you can but come I, back again. <laughs> we always want to talk about that. So I love, real estate. I love buying properties for pennies on the dollar. I've bought properties through uh, auctions. And that's always fun because you can get heated up holding that little card up, you know, oh, I'll take the next bid. Uh, and I've also bought foreclosures. But the one place where I really enjoy buying properties for pennies on the dollar is through the state auditor auction. Every state in the United States has a state auditor office. And this is in my book, You Can Do It. Okay. <laughs> and that's on real estate investing. But yeah. I give key points in that. Every state has a state auditor office. And, the, and part of what the state auditor office does is some people don't pay their property taxes on their home, commercial property, what have you. And after a period of time, those properties end up in the state auditor office because the taxes have not been paid for three or four years. Then it's up to the state auditor office to get it off their books. So they'll hold an auction every year. Now in my state, it may differ from other people's uh, states that they live in, but I guarantee you there's a state auditor office in your state. They'll yeah. hold an auction once a year and they'll have a list of all the properties they're going to auction off. They'll give the date, the time, location, and it's by county. And I and my brother also have a business. I have four businesses, and one of them is uh, the business that we buy and sell properties. Mm -hmm. And we investigate where these properties are, we check the condition of them, and we decide, yes, we're gonna bid on this, or no, we're not gonna bid on that. We'll go to the state auditor auction, and we'll start bidding and, and that's how we acquire properties. And then once we get the deed, we sell them. But mm -hmm. I went in because I was so excited. This was several years ago. I got the itch to buy a property. So I went to this state auditor auction and I don't advise this. So please hear this disclaimer. Always <laughs> investigate okay. the property before you bid on it. But I was excited and I got my number and I knew where this particular property was, kind of. Mm -hmm. I had not set eyes on it. I just knew 
I wanted to buy property. So I bid on it. They started the bidding at $10 and I didn't have anybody bid against me. And I thought, yes, I got a property. Yay, me. So I ended up getting the deed. And I, by the time I got the deed, I thought, well, I need to sell you now. So I guess I need to go look and see what you look like. And I went and it was a trailer that had a very large padlock on it with a big sign <laughs> that said, do not enter unsafe. This was a meth house. <laughs> no. so I thought, yes, that's what I thought too. I thought, okay, uh, I can't hold on to you. Yeah. So I, what I did was I marketed it. I put it on Facebook, all those yard sale sites on Facebook. And I was, I put it out on the table. I said, this is a trailer. It's uninhabited and you can't live in it. It has to be removed. It was a meth house. However, you're buying the trailer and the lot that it's on. I ended up selling that <laughs> and I made money on it. So wow. I don't advise anyone to buy a property sight unseen, but it worked out in my favor. And ever since then, I learned my lesson. We always investigate, set eyes on the property, and then before we go to the bidding table. But wow, that, that could have went really so bad. Yeah. So well, let me ask you, um, what do you do? So let's say, and we've had this happen, you know, uh, we deal, of course, in asset protection um, for real estate investors. That's our biggest niche, and we do it for entrepreneurs as well. But when what happens if you got that property and you were not able to sell? You're still beholden for all the taxes and the back taxes for it, correct? Or do you have some grace period for that? So how does that part work? Well, you're not... Once you buy it and you get that deed, you're not responsible for the back taxes because I wasn't the oh. taxes. Now I'm going to be responsible for any taxes from the day I get the deed and on. So I would have just kept dropping the price just to get rid of it. Yeah. But not responsible, not responsible for back taxes because I wasn't the owner. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes sense too. Yeah. 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 I don't... <laughs> I guess I'm learning something new today too, for some reason, because I haven't done that for, for those. Okay. Cause I always thought, well, now you're going to get these taxes. See, I, you know, I'm still n new on the investments that um, sure. I've done. And so that's, that's really in interesting for that. But I'm, I'm curious, like, why would they get, why do you think, so this brings me to my other question on, uh, because you would think that, so that happens, whatever, but somebody has that property, they have these taxes. Why don't they just finagle one of their friends? To come in and do the same thing right but they don't do right. that and no. because i guess you know there's people just don't know what they don't know but what are some other keys of that people can take advantage of buying properties uh, really low maybe not that low but you know really <laughs> <Right>. low <laughs> well definitely the state auditor office but also foreclosures are another great way there's all mm -hmm. kinds of websites that show foreclosed properties you can actually contact local banks uh, and find out, hey, do you have any properties that are on the foreclosed books that you want to get off your books or getting ready to be foreclosed on? Mm -hmm. Now, depending on the banking institution, they may or may not be able to tell you all of the properties or certain properties, but I have bought properties that way. And it's not illegal. I mean, the bank wouldn't give me the information if they literally were not allowed to, but they don't want them on their books because they're not going to make any money on them. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hold on to those properties because as long as they hold on to those properties, they're going to have to take care of maintaining those properties. They've got to take care of the, the yard. They've got to keep going out to the property to make sure, uh, you know, squatters aren't in there. There's a wide array of reasons why banks don't want to hold on to those properties. And then there's also foreclosed uh, websites that you can search as well. There's a website, uh, www.hudhomestore.com, and it'll give you a map of the continental United States. Mm -hmm. You can click on the state, and then you can actually type in the specific county of, the, of where you want to see if there are any foreclosed properties on there. And then of course there is a bidding process. There's, there's a form you have to fill out generally with a real estate agent. But I, uh, I bought a property, I've actually bought several properties that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes they'll tell you that they can't take that price. I, I had um, the real estate agent fill out the paperwork and I told him, well, this is what I wanna pay for it. And of course, every time there's a bid that they decline, 
they have to send an email to let you know because they have to have a record of it because that's a government agency. Mm -hmm. And the email after email, no, we're not going to accept it. And I just told the real estate agent, I said, let them know, look, I know this property you've had for a while and nobody else is bidding against me. So you may as well sell it to me for this price because that's what I want to give you. <laughs> <laughs> and they actually accepted the price. Nobody else was bidding against me. Otherwise, they would have sold wow. it. Wow. They kept coming back with, you know, $20,000 more than what my bid was. And I said, I'm not going to give you that. I'll give you this. And then, and they did take it. So, <laughs> so your advice is to hold, to hold your ground. Like if you, well, I think you've done it a, a, a while. So you might have just had a good idea of what that property right. would go for. So if you're confident is what you're saying that no, yes. this is what you can do. It's perfectly okay because the worst thing they'll say is no. Well, that's right. That's right. And I think even before they, they uh, accepted my offer, I think for a week I would, I forgot to tell you this. I increased my bid or my offer $1 every day and oh. just $1. So whatever my bid was, I said, okay, they won't accept that. Let's go up $1. And then finally that Friday morning, I said, look, you need to let them know I'm not going to go anymore. If they want to take this offer, this is what I'll buy it for. Yeah. And that's when they accepted. That's that is so shrewd. Because I've, I've seen <laughs> a lot of real estate agents even say, you know, whatever the price is set by the bank, you have to accept that. So it's interesting that you actually can go back to them at a lower number than what they say. So that's, that's really interesting advice. And something to note on that is look and see how long that property has been on the market. Okay. You know, because sometimes real estate agencies will will try to sell a foreclosed property because then maybe the banking right. institution has listed it with them. And mm -hmm. you can call them and say, how long has this property been, you know, been on the market? If it's longer than 30 days, the longer the property is on the market unsold, the more difficult it will be to sell it. Yeah. You know, there's been properties that have been on the market for three months, six months. And if they're not selling, that means they are having to maintain that property. And I even say that, look, you're having to maintain that lawn. You're having to go take pictures and make sure there's no vagrants, no one living in the house, no squatters. Don't you just want to get it off your books? I mean, you may as well just sell it to me. <laughs> so, you know, that's a win-win situation. The longer that the house has been on the market, that's really a bargaining mm -hmm. tool for you as a buyer. Yeah. So do you find that going to that, to the foreclosures, especially if they're still bank owned or, you know, the bank is trying to do this, that, you know, because everyone's like, oh, a foreclosure. Well, that just means the last family set fire to the living room and had a camp out. And, you know, they have this idea that foreclosures will have graffiti on the wall and all this stuff like that. So in your, your estimation, you know, it's really not like that. It's being maintained. They want to get, get rid of it. Right. You know, it's not that bad. Plus you have to do right. your due diligence. You oh, can, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the house that I was telling you about that I bought from the mm -hmm. hudhomestore.com, mm -hmm. that house actually, I had investigated, it was on, it, it was foreclosed two years prior, but because of the bank and the HUD home store, it didn't get listed until two years later, but it was on, it was on their books for a while. So I went and I actually did some due diligence. They had new central air, they had new furnace, they had a new hot water tank and the roof was intact and the windows were intact. And I went in and obviously I, I put in new electric, new plumbing, new carpet, new kitchen, two new bathrooms. So the, and of course paint, you know, put the lipstick and the rouge on it. Right. So it was a nice young couple that bought it. They had two little girls and I felt so good about them buying it because I knew they're not going to have to do anything to this house okay. unless they really want to make a change. And maybe in 10 years, they'll have to replace the roof. But I felt so good about selling it to them. Nice young couple, first time home buyer that it was a win-win situation. It was a win for me because I marketed a great product. And it was a win for them because they weren't going to have to do anything to it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. That's well, really when, a good thing. You're feeling. looking at properties. Um, are you looking at, do you always look for that kind of a condition or do you take other ones that are, are, you know, maybe less condition that needs some work? 
Oh, absolutely. I have no problem with buying properties that need more mm -hmm. work than what I just stated. Yeah. Uh, but always check. I mean, sometimes uh, if you can get in the house, obviously, you know, sometimes when people are getting foreclosed on, they'll dump concrete down the mm -hmm. toilet or the tub. And, you know, you're going to, and sometimes that's a day of discovery. You don't know that until after yeah. you've been there. But, right. and, and not everybody does that. Some people mm -hmm. just do that because they're angry. Mm -hmm. So that's not always the case, though. You can buy yeah. foreclosed properties that are not that bad yeah. Okay. What about location? Um, do you usually buy around your current area where you live, or are you, you, or what do you re recommend people that are starting or maybe people that have done some flips? What, what kind of recommendation have for location? Do you sure. Well, location is absolute key when you're mm -hmm. going to buy and sell, if you're going to flip. Uh, location, location, location. You know, <laughs> if you buy a trailer uh, in Podunk, Tennessee, you know, it might be worth $20,000. But if you put yeah. that same trailer in uh, West Palm Beach, you're talking mm -hmm. half a million or a million. It just depends. Or, or Malibu, you're talking a million, million five. So mm -hmm. location absolutely is important. But if you're just starting, you might not want to buy a property two states away. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to <laughs> buy a property where you're going to have access to it, easy access, maybe right. within a hour drive or so mm -hmm. if you're just starting out but then as you start doing it more and more often then you know you know what you're doing your feet are wet you're yeah. not wet behind the ears so to speak and then you can venture out a little bit more so do, do yeah. you um get comparables when you do that do you have like do you ever work with partners so let's say you're doing outside your 100 your i was thinking 100 miles but whatever oh. the hour drive <laughs> <laughs> but outside your hour drive, do you have like a real estate agent or people that you try to partner with to say, hey, I, you know, I'm really, really interested in this house. Can you just do a drive by or, or how do you do that? Yes, I actually will do the drive by myself or and I and I'll partner with real estate agencies uh, and, you know, agents that I trust. And I'll say, do some comps for me, would you please? Because that's another thing. If you might buy a really great house that you're going to flip. But let's say when it's all said and done, you're going to have, say, 300000 in this house. Well, if this, and you want to sell it, let's say you want to sell it for 300000 mm -hmm. so you make a profit. But if all the houses in that neighborhood only sell for one fifty or 200000 that's not going to be good to try to flip that if you're expecting to sell it for 300000 okay. Need to check and see what all those houses sell for before you buy the house that you want to flip. Because then that's also going to determine how much money are you going to put in that house and then how much are you going to market it for where you still make a profit. Mm -hmm. So definitely location is key and then also doing some comps in that area so that you know what those houses sell for. Yeah, we did a blog post about that not too long ago. So I was curious as to, as to your viewpoint. But yeah, it's, yes. you know, basically it's just smart, smart business uh, moves to do that. Okay, so... All this they can find in your money matters, motivation methods, and no, okay, money matters, motivation <laughs> methods, and manners for increase. And they can find yes. this on Amazon, and we'll be able yes. to put the link here, right, Tammy, and all of her information? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is correct. We'll have all of that in the in the notes. Because we actually have two books from you. You are yes. you are a best-selling author twice. You have a real estate book. You can do it. Real estate investing made simple. And then you have the Money Matters book, right? Yes. yes. Oh, that's great. Okay. Is there anything else you want to tell our audience about you and what you do or maybe your website or anything you want to give us? Oh, sure. Well, my website is KarenFord.org. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I'm an author. I'm a speaker. I give financial freedom seminars. I'm available for that. But for those that are maybe listening that have debt and you think that you're, it's hopeless situation because you're thinking, I have way too much debt. Listen, there is always hope for your situation, no matter how much debt you have. Because my thoughts are, if you got into debt, you can get out of debt. And for those that are considering trying out the real estate investing, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> you can do it because the market is really great. Still do your due diligence, still learn, listen to podcasts like this one here, make sure you're, you're learning in the process. 
but don't think that you can't do it. You can do it. I love that. You can do it. You can do it. Yeah, you can do it. Well, I just want to thank you so much for coming on. I feel like I've learned so much, even things that I think I might have known, but I didn't know. And it was just really great. And I can't wait to go and get your book. And, uh, and I hope that we can maybe even have you back because I think that we could probably talk for hours on all your stories. And what you <laughs> I so appreciate great. it. It's my pleasure. I so enjoyed this. Yeah, this thank was so fun. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay, well, Tammy, take it away. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you again so much, Karen. Uh, if you do want to get a hold of Karen, like she said, it's karenford.org. And uh, if you have any questions for her that you would like us to pass along, uh, please feel free to email me. My email is Tammy, T-A-M-M-Y, at leafylegalservices.com. Uh, also, if you uh, would like, if you are interested in joining us on the podcast or you have uh, someone that you would like to come on as a guest, please feel free to email me and uh, I'll take any questions as well. We love to hear from our audience. So please also find us on Facebook, Instagram. We're all over the place. We now are up on Pinterest and uh, Twitter and we are at Leafy Legal Services. So thank you all again for joining us. Thank you again, Karen, so much. It's been been a pleasure you. we've really enjoyed it so and brian and jennifer we'll awesome. see you next time thank all you right. thank you karen and, and thank uh, you hope you guys all enjoy follow us on facebook twitter and instagram